the best thing about this podcast, this medical disruptor podcast, is that I get to meet the coolest medical disruptors. This week, I meet Dr. Vincent Leonti. Everyone calls him Dr. Vinny. And he started as an ER doc, but then he came over to the dark side. Of course, otherwise he wouldn't be on the Medical Disruptor podcast. But his journey actually started when he was 14, when his father had a life-threatening heart attack. He's going to tell us about it. And this was a life-changing moment for him, and he decided that he wants to become a doctor. So he spent his first 24 years during emergency medicine and then family medicine, but then he develops heart disease, and his daughter has health issues that cannot be solved by conventional medicine. And so he starts doing what we all do, which is he starts researching and goes into functional medicine. Wait till you hear how he describes the difference between conventional and functional medicine. And now he opened up this amazing practice in New Jersey, and he considers himself a functional medicine generalist, meaning that he treats so many issues. But P.S., and by the way, he also is amazing with Lyme. So anyway, without further ado, let's meet Dr. Vinny together. Let's go. Dr. Vinny, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to get to know you. And, and I am also excited, Dr. A. <laughs> okay, so I first want to start with how you got into medicine, because it sounds like a pretty interesting story. Sure. Yeah, so when I was uh, 14 years old, in a blizzard in, in Long Island in New York, my dad was out shoveling snow. He was 47 years old, and he uh, had terrible crushing chest pain. And ambulance was called. As you imagine, during a blizzard, it's pretty hard for the ambulance to get there. But they got there finally. They took him off to the hospital. And we, you know, we couldn't go because of the weather. And we were, you know, and we didn't know we were going to see him again. He was, oh. you know, he was pretty, he was pretty ill. Whoa. But he had a great cardiologist. The guy stayed with him in the hospital, like, all night. And he pulled him through. And I was like, yeah, I want to be like that guy. I want to be a, a doctor like him. So, yeah, that's when I decided I was going to do it. So it was good news. Yeah. Yeah. He survived. He survived. survived. Wow. Yep. And ultimately, at what age did he pass, if I may ask? Passed at age 70. Okay. God bless. From heart issues? Yep. Heart issues. Yeah. Heart issues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm leading up to kind of where you're going. So then... You decided to go and you became an emergency medicine doctor, mm -hmm. yep. right? How long yep. did you do that for? Only for 24 years. Only? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's just 24 years. It's fine. And then what happened? And then, you know, if you do something like that for 24 years, you know, I, my training was ac is actually family medicine. And I, I went into a practice very briefly after my residency that didn't work out. So I went to the ER temporarily. And it was temporary, 24 years of temporary. I mean, and it's temporary. It's just a long right. temporary. <laughs> I guess it's all temporary. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Life is temporary. So, and then one, one day, one of my friends, my running buddy, he was director of family medicine in a uh, hospital in uh, Binghamton, New York. And he said, how long are you going to do that for? And I was like, I don't know. He said, well, we have a place in family medicine for you. I'm like. Sign me up. So I left family medicine. I left the ER medicine and went to conventional family medicine for about eight years. And but then something, the, something must have happened to land you on my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so my daughter started to uh, look into holistic medicine, um, started selling some nutritional supplements. And then she and my grandson had some issues. Um, and that brought her further down that path. She became an integrative health coach. Um, Were you resistant and, to it at first? Were you like, oh, supplements? Yeah, yeah. No, totally. I was totally like, resistant. What? You don't need <laughs> supplements. They're just selling you nonsense, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to go through that, that phase. You have to go through that phase. <laughs> we all have that phase. Though, yeah, no, right? it's important. Yeah. And I want to bring that to light because I one of the things repeatedly that you hear on this podcast is like this this transition, we have to unlearn, right? So I bring that to light. Trust me. <laughs> as, as yeah, I, call myself totally. an ex, I call myself a recovering medical gaslighter because <laughs> I used to do this stuff all the time also. Okay. So yeah. first you're like, yeah, supplements, but then it started helping your daughter? Yeah, it was, you know, it started helping my daughter and started helping my grandson. 
and and she was like, you know, what are you doing? Take a Dad? course in functional medicine. I'm like, what's functional medicine? What is what? this nonsense? <laughs> Wikipedia says it's absolute chicanery. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I love that word chicanery. I don't know where it's it came from. My SAT it came from the back of my head. So I decided to look into that chicanery and I went to an Institute of Functional Medicine course and I just loved it. I loved the, you know, what they were saying from the stage. I, I felt the power of it. And, you know, you've probably had experiences going to what I call conventional medical conferences where everybody looks slightly or more than slightly depressed and they tell you how many <laughs> hours they have till they can retire. And, and then you go to the functional medicine conference and people are dancing in the aisles and high-fiving each other and t- saying how much they love medicine. And, uh, I was like, this is great. This is great. Everyone's drinking from the crazy Kool-Aid. That's right. But I still, you know, I still hadn't made... You didn't fully go in. Yeah. You try to dabble with it at first. I was still doing conventional family medicine. And you try at first to bring in some tidbits, right? Right. I could change this. I can. Yeah. And then you realize you can't. And and then (laughs) I'm like, Joe, I can reverse your diabetes. Great, Mm. Doc. What do I have to do? Joe, stop eating your Italian bread. Doc, give me the insulin. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. You know, you bring up a good point here. There's so many good points you brought, but a lot of the times we're talking about the providers, what the providers know, and we definitely need more of that. But there's also different types of patients. And mm-hmm. I still practice conventional medicine every Monday in my practice, and the rest of the time I do other things. On conventional medicine day, these are patients that prefer the medication over the nutritional changes. And that's okay. Yeah. As long as as long as we're controlling it one way or the other, that's okay. But it's not just provider dependent, right? It's patient dependent also. Not everybody wants Absolutely. to do the work. Okay. So when did you or did you get frustrated from like the conventional world? Um so it went from that was, let's see, that would have been like February of twenty sixteen. And then my daughter and I we started having discussions and she was like she was living down here in Lawrenceville. She married a guy from Lawrenceville. So she was living down here. She had our first grandchild. God bless. And she was like, you know, you guys should move down. I'm like, mm, I'm just a few years away from, I'm not that far from retirement. I don't want to start working for somebody else. And she was like, no, come on down. Well, I'll help you create a practice. We'll practice, you know, I'll be the holistic coach and you'll be the physician. And we'll just, you know, go into practice. And I was like, hmm. I don't know. How hard could that be? How hard could that be? (laughs) People, I worked in the ER. People came to me. I worked in conventional family medicine. People came to me. And then then I found out what it was like to actually open a practice and start from ground zero. You know, we moved from upstate New York, so I had absolutely no connections in this area at all. Very Um, hard to start. Yeah. And you started it as a functional medicine practice or? Yeah. Yeah. We went all in on. Functional in, medicine. No insurance. No insurance. That's a different type of model. It's a much more difficult model to get off the ground because when you have insurance, you kind of are going to get patients that you'll have a panel. You'll Patients even that you didn't go out, they'll just find you. They'll mm-hmm. go on their directory and find you. Here, there's marketing involved and getting your name out. It's a whole different business model. Yeah. It only... Took us five to six years to really get off the ground. I know. It's what five, I mean, compared to your twenty temporary twenty four years, <laughs> five to six years. It's another six years. I love so. this. But listen, I don't know if you know this. I'm sure you do. But like this, you know, arc, this narrative arc is exactly the story of every single provider I've met, with the exception of one. Whereas we start off in conventional medicine, and we certainly think we're doing the right thing for our patients. And we are doing the right thing for our patients. We just don't realize the blinders that we have. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then something happens to someone in our family. In my case, it was my wife. In your case, it was your daughter. My wife had an autoimmune issue called PMLE. I don't know if you're comfortable sharing what your daughter was dealing with. A polymorphous light eruption. Um, oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And we were just advised, okay, it is what it is. Stay out of sun. She had to completely change her career. She was Division One softball coach high heavy duty steroids if she did go in the sun it, she was like out for weeks because it would just completely destroy her 
And never ever did all these great, amazing doctors who are good hearted with me, no malice in mind, never ever did they tell us there was a connection to nutrition because they didn't know. They didn't know. This, they don't know. They didn't know. And this is before the internet. And so my wife and I went hunting into the land of the crazy. We're both in medicine. <laughs> She's a PA. We met in the ER and we stumbled upon functional medicine and we changed her nutrition and her PMLE reversed and her, she had bad psoriasis and reversed. And we're like, the heck is this? <laughs> and then like you, I went to IFM in the first class. I'm like, oh, it's very cute. Nutrition. Uh, you try it, you know, meet a lot of resistance. in in initially you go crazy as a provider because you know you could do more. Now, you know, it can't be like this, Joe. There's so much more we could do for you. It's mm -hmm. very frustrating. And so you end up establishing something. So this arc where it's either you or someone that you love who struggles and really forces you to challenge what you, that scientific rigor that, you know, we all kind of grew up with in school. And then you're challenging it like, it can't be, it can't be that it's wrong. It's not wrong. It's just not the whole picture, right? It's just the whole mm -hmm. picture. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I just want to, I don't know if you knew that. I just want to normalize that experience for you. Yeah, no, yeah, you hear the, you're right. Yeah, I hear the story over and over again when yeah. I go to conferences and talk to people. We'll catch you into this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we'll catch you into this. That story. I yeah. only met one provider who was like, I was just was curious and I went into it. And then as she went into it, she discovered she was unwell and then cheated herself. So it was like the reverse order. So, so, okay. So now you're officially a medical disruptor. Like, yeah, I would say that. Yeah. I would say that. Okay. Tell me, you know, where do you feel that like you disrupt the most? Where, like, where do you feel like people are coming to you? No, let's look at it this way. What's, what's your jam? You know, I feel like I've become the generalist in the functional medicine world, if you will. You know, I like that. More of fa the family doc in the functional medicine world where whatever problem, pretty much any problem people come to me with, you know, I feel like I have something that I can do for them. You know, I feel, you know, I tell people, I, you know, as a family medicine doc, when I was in conventional family medicine, you see people and you send them out to the specialists. Right. Cardiologists right. and neurologists, the gastroenterologists. And, and then I'm sitting in this chair and people are coming into me who have seen four, six, eight, 19 specialists. And they're like, <laughs> and they're like, can you help me? And I'm like, yeah, well, I can. Actually, yes, I think yes, I, can. I can. Yeah. yeah. Can. Just because we have a philosophical, different philosophy of, of looking at things, right? Correct. You know, things that, as you said, nutrition and the gut and all of that is so foundational to people's health, but people just have no clue. The yeah. Most part. You know, it's funny you said that because when we were just in conventional medicine, the person that came to you with that big, thick file, having seen 16 patient, you were like, oh my God, this patient's crazy. Right. Now it's almost a prerequisite to come find you or I. Please right. see as many specialists as you can. I want to see that file. Honestly, I've had sometimes people reach out to me who have not done that road. And I was like, whoa, you need to do that road first. So you have to get it all checked out first. So now, yes, you have seen <laughs> 27 people. Perfect. You're in the right place. Let's go. <laughs> it's so funny how that changes, you know? Yeah. 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 Right? You know, your colleagues back in the day before IFM, they're like, oh my God, she brought the file with her. Here we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then usually branded fibromyalgia. Right. There's, uh, yeah. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh yeah, 20? No problem. <laughs> Let's go. And honestly, I think it's a great patient experience also because the patients, oh, okay. Because they know they're like, you see them, right? You see them, they're like, sometimes they're so hesitant because I'm sure you, I give them an hour on the first consult and you could see that they're rushing through the story. And I'm like, you have time. I'm actually going to ask you even more questions. There's, they're not used there. It's almost like a PTSD to like, what? We have time. We could talk about my childhood, even mm -hmm. though I'm 74, like so it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting place. So you mentioned something about true health. What does that mean? To me, that means, you know, not just managing disease, but actually making people feel well, feel better, taking into account quality of life and energy and vitality. And in the process of doing that, you know, helping them to overcome their medical problems. 
you know, reverse their autoimmune conditions and, you know, get over long COVID and, you know, chronic Lyme disease and fibromyalgia. Wait, you mean long COVID and chronic Lyme disease are real? Are you crazy? <laughs> well, huh? Yeah. So true health, I imagine that part of that is, you know, it really makes me laugh when we talk about the annual wellness visit in conventional medicine, right? And, you know, and Medicare really wants to make sure you get that annual wellness visit. And really, it's just the absence of illness or the identification of illness. That's your wellness visit. Here's your ICD-10, yeah. hypertension. Here's your... But there's absolutely nothing well about it. Mm -hmm. So I imagine what you mean by true health is not just the absence of disease, but actually health. Actual health. Yeah. Actual, you know, yeah. Which is not what we deal with in conventional medicine. Conventional medicine is just disease or absence of disease. But right. there's no conversation of wellness or health. Mm -hmm. yep. which is, yeah, true health. I love that. And what do you feel is like the root cause preventing people from achieving this true health? Well, you know, different people have different root causes, I would say. Um, you know. I mentioned some of them, the long COVID, the chronic Lyme, the right. toxins that people have, you know, and sometimes, you know, when they're wrapped up in those illnesses, sometimes uh, what's mm. between, you know, mm. between their ears is what is uh, preventing them from getting healthy again. So you have to deal with that issue also. Oh, that's a big one. I want to touch on that in a second. Let me just, before we get there, you mentioned Lyme now. So are you, would you consider yourself like Lyme literate? Like you... You treat Lyme and chronic Lyme? And if so, what? Yes. Yeah, that's amazing. Did you do any special training for that? Yeah, I, I mentored with, with one of the, with the Lyme, in a Lyme mentorship group for three years. Yep. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so anyone listening to this, if you have Lyme, because Lyme is not my jam, I would say mold is more my jam. But if someone yeah. listens and you're thinking of Lyme, you have to go to Dr. Vinny. That's great because you, I don't think you could be all things for all people. It's really Absolutely. important. Absolutely to yeah. know your strength and your comfort zone. Because these things take time to learn. I don't know that people like, you know, you did this mentorship and I think we met you on, or did you were doing a mentorship with Neil Nathan as well from Mold? Or something with Neil um, I mean, his, yeah, I'm in his uh, Mold mentorship group. Yeah. Right. And so I don't think people understand like to become proficient in these crazy topics, you have to spend a lot of time learning it. And so the fact that you took that time to learn to become Lyme literate is really important. And I went to dinner with a conventional medicine colleague of mine who's infectious disease and literally rolled his eyes on the concept of chronic Lyme. It's like, you either have it or you don't. Like, you either have it or you don't. And I was like, wow. And I said, okay. I mean, I'm not going to have that conversation. But it's amazing because so many people are going to go to that, you know, the quest test and think it's, you know, a negative is a negative or a positive and you take a doxy and you're done. Do you mind speaking a little bit about why we can't really, if you're comfortable, if, forgive me, I'm going off topic, why we can't really trust kind of these conventional Lyme tests? Yeah. So with conventional Lyme tests, first they do, they want to do the ELISA, you know, which is really not all that sensitive or specific. And only if you pass the, you know, you get the positive or the false positive on the ELISA, do you get to go do a Western blot, which is better, but still, you know, these tests are not great because when somebody has chronic Lyme disease, especially their immune system is compromised. So, and this, you know, the only way that. I would say that the conventional world would call a Lyme test positive if you have one of the five of the C approved Lyme bands. You can't have the Lyme band that some people got vaccinated against, even though it's one of the really specific ones. You know, if you have that one and you have four others, uh, if you don't have that one, yeah, then, then it doesn't you're count. negative. Yeah, it you're doesn't negative. count. What are those so, mean? Who cares? You're negative. <laughs> so... I feel that, unfortunately, I think a lot of people are missed because of that. And so, so it's both the testing is not great to begin with. And then the interpretation of the testing is, leaves a lot to be desired. I would say. Yeah. So you like to use Igenix? 
I do use Igenix. There's a lab here in New Jersey, Medical Diagnostic Laboratories, that mm. specializes in doing Lyme, and they're covered by insurance. So oh, we this use is them. great to know. I didn't know this. Yep. So, um, so we usually, I, I tell people we're, we're going to do a two-step process. If we don't get an answer that makes sense from uh, MDL, Medical Diagnostic Laboratories, then we will you know, use so Igenix or Galaxy. So let me make sure I understand that because thank you for enlightening me. So you'll start with your local lab, which is known. But if you really feel like this person is lab is likely to have Lyme, the story matches, the symptoms match, and you don't, and then maybe it's a negative or not a strong positive, that's when you'll say, let's go to Igenix. Right. I might say go to Igenix or I might just say if they have enough symptoms, I might just say, we're going to clinically, we're going to treat you. So we okay. could do the hygienics to confirm if you want, but you know, you're going to be treated one way or the other. Yeah. I love that. You have those people who, who no matter what are going to be negative in the beginning. And if you treat them, then their immune system starts to sure. you know, uh, become more activated. And all of a sudden they're, you know, they have 10 bands on, you know, when you test them next time. Absolutely. So, and do you like to treat with antibiotics or just supplements or both? I, I I tend to use both. If somebody's really symptomatic, I'll, I like to go to antibiotics first because that's how you get the most rapid response. Absolutely. And I usually use, you know, two antibiotics, not too often three, but, you know, usually two. And then I'll start putting the herbs in as we're doing the antibiotics so that we can transition them off the antibiotics as yeah. quickly as possible. And and I, I asked that question specifically because a lot of times people have the misconception, the public has a misconception that if you're going to go functional or holistic, that means no medication whatsoever. And that's not true. To be truly integrative, and I want to say this to our listeners, you really want to find a provider, I think, that's well-versed in both worlds. Because there are times without question that you're going to need some pharmaceuticals. Like, for example, I battled H. pylori for a while and I really tried to do with supplements and it didn't, was not successful. And I'm not messing around H. pylori, 11% increased risk for Alzheimer's. It's significant. I don't know the percent increase for esophageal cancer. Like, why would I not take antibiotics? So do I love to give antibiotics for sniffles? Of course not. Am I going to do everything in my power to avoid? Of course not. But I love that integrated, truly integrated approach is to use pharmaceuticals, use herbals, and we don't want to have new blinders on where we say absolutely no to anything pharmaceutical, right? We want to have both worlds. So thank you for bringing it up to surface because I want people to know that. Sometimes people are like, I don't want any medication. And, you know, it's, and even, you know, Neil Nathan, who's our mutual guru around mold, he'll be the first to tell you, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I love him. Yeah. He's great. He's yeah. great. Anyone out there who's battling mold, Neil Nathan is the guru. Find his book. We don't get paid to talk about him. He's just amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned earlier what's between the ears when someone's unwell. And that's really important because especially when you're chronically ill, we know that when you're chronically ill, you get used to being ill. Your central nervous system gets used to being ill. You get stuck in illness. And, you know, in the questions that, that we discussed kind of before this, when you said, what is the importance of mental, emotional, spiritual health? For those of you who don't know, and then I'm going to hand this over to you, for those of you who don't know, when we study fun functional medicine, we don't just talk about how's the heart, how's the skin, how's the brain. Right in the center of what we call our matrix is this mental and spiritual and emotional health. And at the core of everything is your mental, emotional, spiritual health, because how could we get your body healthy? If that M-E-S in the center is not okay. So tell me a little bit more about why you said that. Yeah, because, you know, when people come here, they often have been sick, as you said, for a long time. Months, years. Mm. And, you know, they're discouraged. They're sometimes hopeless. And they just don't believe that they can get better. And so I find it an important part of my practice to give them hope, you know, to reassure them that there are definitely things that can be helpful to them and that they just have to trust that process and know that they can get better. I mean, certainly there are programs that people can go to that, you know, help with the autonomic nervous system yeah. and, you know, the program, Gupta, Apollo, yeah, DNRS, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, all of those. But 
what I've really found with my patients is just reassuring them that really there is hope. I've seen people like you get better before yeah. that, you know, they tell me, you know, when finally, you know, they actually start to feel that they start to feel that they're getting better. They tell me they're like, you know, the most important thing you did for me was just to give me hope. Oh my God. I love that. It's so true. Sometimes I feel that sometimes the consult itself starts to feel curative because when someone does a consult me, they won't necessarily continue working with me. Everyone's different. But just that moment where you're like, I believe you. You're not mm -hmm. crazy. It's not in your head. And then to your point, and we could do something about it. And just holding on to that hope, especially if you've been to, like you said, 20 doctors who were like, well, I don't know what to do with you. So that's great. That is great. And that, that hope is a big issue. But for anyone listening with dealing with chronic illness, it's more than just fixing the body. It's more than just getting rid of the bands, getting rid of the mold, fixing the gut. You really have to spend some time working on that central nervous system. And then I even had one patient who said to me, you know, I'm well now. And I don't know what to do with this identity. Because she was like, you know, before if people asked me to go out or whatever, I, I couldn't because I was sick. Now I don't have an excuse. I have to say, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I love how hard you laughed at that. But it was a really interesting and honest point because she's like, I have to create a new identity for myself. You know, she was also very dependent on her partner. Now she wants to be independent. Her partner is not used to her being independent. So there's layers to getting healthy that is more than just, you know, just the med. And none of which that we've learned in any type of conventional medicine school. <laughs> very true. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, oh, my goodness. This is so good. I know you mentioned, you know, in our question, also talking about a little bit about inflammation. Did you want to touch on that? Sure. Like, um, yeah. What could be causing inflammation? Yeah. Inflammation, you know, to me is one of, you know, uh, one of the things that underlies, you know, ends up being one of the common root causes of many different things. But you know, inflammation comes from many sources. As I said, it, it can come from, you know, we talked, we've been talking about Lyme, we've been talking about, mentioned long COVID. It can come from eating the, the, the sad diet, the uh, standard oh, yeah. American diet, you know, and developing insulin resistance, which I think, you know, is the other big uh, epidemic in this country that, you know, is affecting more people than Lyme disease cancer, you know, more than anything, and it is the root cause of all of those things, diabetes, cancer, you know, heart disease, dementia, all of that. So it's insulin resistance, it's inflammation, and it's, yeah, looking to see what your root causes are. Root cause, yeah. Yeah. Root causes for inflammation, yeah. Figuring out what's actually happening. It's crazy. It's a crazy <laughs> concept. <laughs> so... Who do you want to reach out to? You want to reach out to people who are not feeling well, people who are um, dealing with Lyme, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, it's those people. It's the, you know, it's really the people who have been that discarded by the medical world, but really yeah. don't have an answer in the medical, in the conventional yeah. medical world. You know, that they just, they're not feeling well. They don't have the energy and vitality that they used to have, and they just don't have an answer. I mean, those are ultimately yeah. the people we want to help. So, you know, sometimes they know what their diagnosis is or they suspect it. And certainly we want those people, but sometimes they just don't know. They, don't know. they know there's something wrong, but they, had, they don't know how to figure that out. Yeah, they don't know how to figure it out. And do you only practice in New Jersey, only patients in New Jersey, or are you able to... Do you, do you think my insurance company is listening or? Oh, <laughs> I got you. Okay. So, um, I, you know, I, I do, you know, I'll tell you, I how was I, a lifelong New York resident. So I, you know, reality yeah. and I live right close to the border of Pennsylvania. So, you know, so I we mean, have people New come over from there often. Of course, of course. Yeah. But, you know, but there's also. That's primarily this, what we do. Primarily. 
Well, there's also this world of, and a lot of practitioners, providers do this. If I'm going to prescribe medication or order in your labs, I can only do that in the state that I'm licensed in. If, however, you want a consultation of just talking educational purposes, I could do that anywhere. And, you know, and that is kind of how, how I manage it. And a mm. lot of times I, like, I work with a hormone specialist who I met through these podcasts as well. And I send her a lot of clients and her consults, she writes all over it just for education purposes only. And then her idea is that, you know, they'll have to get prescriptions and they're, uh, you know, in their state of residency. Just putting that out there for you because mm. such a wealth of information and I'm sure people come to you from all over. So there's different ways of being able to help people who are out of state. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just, just, a thought, yeah. just a thought. <laughs> just a thought. Because I've had to figure that out also. Because you're, you know, the medical disruptors, one of the things I do in this podcast is I want people to know who's around. And we are people who have decided to dedicate time that we could have done something else. We could have learned to play poker. We could have learned to climb a tree. We decided to dedicate time to study these things. Unreimbursed. You spend time learning about Lyme and I spent time learning about whatever learning. You spent your time and your money doing this. And there are not a lot of us. So people are going to come to us. They're going to find us. They talk amongst each other locally. And then, you know, when they listen to this podcast, I, I got outreaches from Lebanon recently. Like the, wow. you know, it just goes everywhere. So I want you to be able, I'm sure you want to, I want you to be able to help as many as possible. So there's just different ways to do it. Because mm -hmm. you're a plethora you. of knowledge, a plethora of knowledge. So of course, I'm going to add all your links so people can find you. Anything that you want our shared audience to know? Any, anything I forgot to ask? I guess I'm a little partial to like heart disease and, you know, you know, oh. you know I don't know. Do you, do you know I have two, two cardiac stents? Do you know? No. If... Hello. Let's go here. Okay. We have <laughs> to talk about this a second. So you yeah, so have this heart is, disease. This, bridge is, this is the whole arc of, you know, I became a doctor and I thought I would be able to avoid heart disease because I followed the American Heart Association diet advice and I ran, I kept in shape. I ran four marathons. And I just figured I, you know, my dad smoked Lucky Strikes. He was 60 pounds sure. overweight. So you so, were good. Yeah. And then one day I was out for a run and developed a severe chest pain. Be quiet. And so was it, was it, let me ask you this. It wasn't your diet. Is it, was it genetic hyperlipidemia or was it not even hyperlipidemia? Was it just like. Would no it hyperlipidemia. Have, would it have been found on a, like a CCTA? Was there a blockage? So I had, prior to this, about five years prior to this, I had a uh, coronary calcium score done and my score was zero. Be quiet. Yep. So what do you so, attribute it to? The, the, the heart disease? Yeah. The blockages? Yeah. Yeah. Would have, well, I, it turned out I, I have uh, an elevated lipoprotein A. You know, I'm assuming this is from my dad because my mom lived to like the age of 92 without Every artery in her body was calcified, but she had no heart disease at all. <laughs> just, she was no dementia, no nothing. She just, God you know, bless. she was, it was amazing. You know, I'm guessing because she just, you know, she ate a, she ate a healthy diet and not That's super healthy. She liked her sweets and things. And she was mildly diabetic, but refused to take medicine. And yeah, but my dad, you know, as I said before, age of 47, had a heart attack. And so I was just blaming it on his, you know, his lack of exercise. His lifestyle, his sure. Lifestyle, yeah. And then it turns out, found out that, you know, genetic risk factor, elevated lipoprotein A. And I did APOE4 testing. And Are you from, I assume you're familiar yeah, with yeah. that. What was, yeah. What's your, you, do you have um, any fours in there? Double APOE4. Ooh, wee, brother. So. Let me tell so, anyone listening what that is. <laughs> well, actually, why don't you tell them? So APOE4 is one of our, you know, we have two genes, you know, one from each parent. APOE4 is a very inflammatory subtype. So if you have inflammation from anything, APOE4 is going to magnify it. You know, if you look into dimension literature, they say that um, people with APOE4s can have, each time you have one of those alleles, you know, 30 to 50 percent. 50% chance of developing dementia in, in, during your lifetime. Yeah. 
But fortunately, there's a thing called epigenetics where you can take care that's of it. That's exactly so right. So happy what I'm doing. But so that's, you know, I think that was another reason. I, obviously, when I was doing conventional medicine, I didn't know that I had these genetic risk factors on, on you know. So, so uh, if you don't mind, let me just take a moment to explain to our shared audience everything we just said, kind of a layman's term. Okay. So yeah. APV4, the way I, I describe it, it's what people call the Alzheimer's gene. And we get one from each parent and there's twos, threes, and fours. So you could be a two, a three, and you get one for each other, a three, three, a four, four. And for all intents and purposes, just think of four as the highest risk for dementia, Alzheimer's. And you get one from each parent. So getting a four, four means that both parents gave Dr. Vinny a higher risk of developing dementia, Alzheimer's. However, the word epigenetics means that just because there are some genes like blue eyes and green eyes, they're yours, nothing you can do about it. There's some genes that we have the power to turn on or express or not. And if we make the right choices, we don't have to turn those on. And the easy, the way I explain that more easily is with diabetes, just because grandma has diabetes and mom has diabetes, if I never eat pizza and cotton candy, I will not get mom's diabetes. It's not automatic. I still have to, I don't have to eat a lot to get it. You know, my neighbor next door might be able to eat 20 pizzas and I'll eat one to get it. But there's still a choice in there before it gets expressed. And that's true for Alzheimer's because people say, oh, I don't want to get tested. I don't want to know. Look, yes, you want to know. Because then you're going to go to Dr. Vinny and say, I have a 4-4. And he's going to be like, so do I. Let me tell you what I do. And you're going to be able to turn it around. So are you also saying that the learning for you, what is the, the learning that you got around your heart was that initially you thought, okay, well, he was a smoker and, you know, overweight. I th lifestyle modification you thought were enough. But are you saying, that, was there something else in your life that was like very inflammatory that you weren't like on top of that you are now on top of? Well, I spent 24 years as an ER physician. Um, <laughs> Duh, E. I'm a little stressed. Um, you know, stress, circadian rhythms, totally disrupted. You know, oh, yeah. we went, yeah. we didn't, we practiced no hygiene around sleep at all. I no. could go from day to night and within 24 hours, turn back around and come back to a day. So sleep patterns, I, I believe, were somewhat disrupted. Huge. Okay. Yeah. So since and I'm not a natural, yeah. I told you I ran four marathons. I'm not a natural long distance runner, but I was able to do that. I think for me that might have. I'm just guessing that was, if it was maybe inflammatory. a little bit too, too yeah, inflammatory too for me. Yeah. No, that's really good because people think with exercise more is more, and there's a point where too much exercise is inflammatory. It's damaging. Yeah. Wow. So. Fascinating. Fascinating. Then um, the American Heart Association died on top of it. The, the low fat, high carb. Uh... What a disaster. What an absolute <laughs> disaster. Oh my God. Like, I just, I can't. <laughs> I just, okay. No. I don't want to, I don't want to make this podcast two hours long. But yeah, <laughs> don't follow that one. Find Dr. Vinny if you have heart issues. Okay. <laughs> now, is there anything else that I forgot to ask you about? No, that's it. <laughs> okay. That was a good one. I'm glad I asked. That was a good one. It was a really good story. And we got to tell people about, you know, APOE4. So it's great. Okay. This was an absolute honor. You are a treasure. I hope a lot of people come to you from this podcast. And I thank you for being here. Dr. E, thank you so much. It's been great meeting you and speaking with you. You're great at what you do here. Thank and you. yeah, well, um, we'll, we'll, we'll have to have dinner together sometime. Oh my God. I would love it. Definitely not high carb, low fat, though. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pleasure. Have a good one. Okay. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.